much to the organizing for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> this is my first time this um, series of conference and I'm enjoying um, a lot these um, the ideas that are uh, up to now have been put forward. So uh, I will add a little bit to, to, to the whole picture. Um, uh, in my talk, I will be focusing on human behavior. I think that uh, um, one of the things that we, we should know if we want to approach, uh, for example, climate change or, or uh, social movements, uh, uh, political decisions, etc., is, is to uh, know a little bit more about human behavior. And, and what I'm going to show now, it's a series of experiments that uh, on the one hand gives some insights, but on the other hand um, is telling us, or they are telling us that we actually know very little about how human behave and react to different uh, real, uh, real situations. Um, so actually we, 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 we are used to characterize humans in different contexts uh, using theoretical models, but sometimes we forget about going back to experiments experimentation. This is at uh, the very origin of physics and, and, and then uh, if we want to analyze humans as uh, social beings, um, I fully agree with what has been said up to now. We also have to take into account interactions, but not interactions only among humans, but also how humans interact with the environment, how humans interact with different uh, governing bodies, etc. So um, I will try to show that um, from a social perspective, uh, why sense, the behavior of individuals at different scales from the very uh, small scale of individual behavior to the very large scale of, for example, uh, the behavior of a large group of people uh, in front of, uh, I don't know, emergency scenarios or whatever, uh, we, we really don't know very much about that. Um, I will try to use some approaches that somehow are borrowed from physics, but at the same time I will also show that it's not the same as studying physical systems. We are not ideal cases in which uh, we assume that all uh, components of the systems are homogeneous, are equivalent. We normally apply uh, mean field theories, uh, average property of the systems, but uh, I will try to show that this is, doesn't apply to humans uh, through a series of, of experiments. Um, and in particular, I would like to highlight uh, that humans are not heterogeneous, so we have to take into account some details and, and, and the specific conditions under which the experiments or, or the different scenarios are, are posed. Um, also, uh, I will try to show that the dynamics is ruled by the way in which we interact with each other and also with the environment and how this is uh, actually taking place. And finally, also, I will show that a few at least, not all, of course, but a few um, paradigms of, in theory, when, when we use theory to model humans, um, are simply misleading. So uh, I will try to show this through three different experiments. The first one will show how we interact with the environment. The second, it's related to a problem that was already uh, brought to this audience by Simon in the morning. It's about um, how human cooperates or coordinates to perform different tasks. And finally, I will also show at the largest scale uh, some results that we have obtained in the last several years about how human behave uh, currently uh, through social networks and, and online, you know, on the online world. So the first one is the interaction with, with the environment. Um, mm, to show that we actually, um, I mean that how we behave depends a lot on how we interact with the environment. I will show a couple of examples. The first one is a very clever and simple experiment that was performed a few years ago. You have the reference there. If you have, it's a three-page paper. It's very simple. Um, it, there was a department in a university in the UK, um, and there is um, a room in which uh, you have coffee and tea. Um, and then I, you, you don't have to pay for the coffee or tea, but if you put milk, then you have to pay for the milk. Um, the, um, the trick is that uh, you are given the freedom to decide how much you pay. Uh, I'm uh, sorry, uh, the cost that you have to pay is free, is, is fixed, but you have the freedom to decide whether you pay or not. 
So if you don't want to pay, you, you don't pay. If you pay, you pay a fixed cost. And each week, the, all the money that is collected is, is um, I mean, it's reset, and, and then the gain you start collecting every week. The trick of the experiment is that in front of the uh, coffee and tea dispatcher, uh, they put different image one per week, uh, some flowers and some image of eyes, essentially human eyes, that were just in front of, of the dispensers and, and looking at you. And, and they, they reco recorded the, the amount of money that is collected every, every week. And you see a large variability uh, in, in collected. Depends a lot on, on, on what you see in front of you. Uh, and this is already showing that we as individuals react to um, a lot of things, um, and, and not only to flowers or faces, but even the, 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 the face that, that we see. Uh, this, this last one looks like a house or something like that is, is the one that achieves the most. And in some sense, as human will, will uh, physicists will, will say, uh, humans can be fine-tuned if you choose the right image, you, you increase your, your, the, the amount of money that you collect. So this is a very simple case. Um, the other one is related to, for example, disease spreading. Um, this is modeling, this is not uh, an experiment. Uh, in the top panel you see uh, a simulation of how um, disease spreads in the states, assuming that it starts in a big uh, hub like New York. And you see that uh, there are red zones. Uh, the, the, the darker it is, the, the higher is the incidence of the disease. Um, and then uh, on the bottom panel, you simulate a situation in which human reacts to the presence of the disease. That, that means that, for example, they change their, their habits or, or their mobility. Uh, they remain at home or stop or refrain from traveling or even change the, the usual um, route that they, they take. Um, and the simulation is telling you that uh, if you look, for example, to the border with Canada, you see that the, the increase, uh, that the disease, uh, incident of the disease increases a lot in, in that area. And this is because we selfish, uh, we are a little bit selfish and, and, and try to avoid very uh, risky spots. But in doing that, we go through areas that were not exposed before, and we bring the epidemics to that place. So this means that this, the, the disease is spread over the whole map more efficiently than before. And this is a result of our reaction to the presence of the disease. If we were aiming to predict the evolution of the disease, this sort of human behavioral change should be taken into account. Otherwise, we we will be uh, predicting or forecasting an incident that is quite low with respect to what it, it actually is. Um, um, the, 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 the other example that I would like to discuss is uh, about laws of human behavior, laws that describe the human behavior. And to this end, I will mm, use as an example one of the most old problems um, in science, but it's also an unsolved problem in modern science, and it's related to the emergence of cooperation in different contexts. Um, cooperation is widespread in nature. You, you can see cooperation among uh, bacteria, among very, um, uh, in the animal kingdom, um, and also, of course, uh, among humans. Uh, uh, we, we have evolved from primitive societies to our modern society thanks to uh, cooperation, essentially. Um, the issue with <clears throat> with cooperative, um, with cooperation is that we don't really understand how cooperation survive in, in, in some scenarios in which uh, it shouldn't survive. Um, and to this end, normally what one used to study this kind of problems is to, uh, is, is what is called social dilemma. Uh, and probably one of the best now example of social dilemma is what is the prisoner's dilemma. In the prisoner's dilemma, you essentially have two types of individuals. One that is cooperator and, 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 and pay a cost to help uh, other people, while there are also the factors that uh, avoid paying the cost uh, but takes the benefits of, of the front cooperators. So from a selfish perspective, um, the best for you is to defect, because no matter what your opponent does, you will never lose. 
but if everybody ends up um, defecting, then the cooperation doesn't survive and everybody loses. No, there is no benefit from, from, uh, for no one. So mutual cooperation is much better than not cooperated individually, and this is the dilemma. From an individual point of view, it's better to the fact, but if you look at the collective effect or at the collective well-being, um, the best is to uh, cooperate. Um, the issue with this is that when you explore these kind of models using game theory, um, uh, the result is that um, mm, you should expect that cooperation doesn't survive. And actually we see cooperation in nature and also in human societies. So the question is why cooperation survives. Uh, it has been proposed that uh, one of the mechanisms that, um, that could sustain cooperation is that populations are not well mixed. So we, we don't have the same um, probability to interact with anybody else in the population. We normally have our social cycles, our contacts, and therefore we live in a network world. Uh, and in, in, in populations have some structure. And, and when you do the, um, the, the same theory, when you apply the same theory on top of networks, then you find that actually cooperation have some change to survive. So um, the, the question here is, okay, that's okay. We, we somehow have a eventual potential explanation uh, for uh, the problem of cooperation, but um, this is at the cost of assuming that some, um, some things about human behavior, and we don't really know if this is actually true. So um, one of the things that we can do is just test theory, as we are usually we are used to do in physics, for example, we develop a theory and then we go to the, exper to do, to the lab and do the experiment and confirm or validate the theory. So here it seems to be a natural way to do the same. So let's see if the theory do the same. Uh, this is what we uh, uh, match the, the experiments. This is what we did in our place in Santa Rosa in 2011. We placed it, uh, the individuals in two different networks one is square lattice la, that, to, the, to, the, to the left, in which everybody has the same number of contacts, in this case, four individuals. So you interact, you play this social dilemma, it's prisoner dilemma game, with your four nearest neighbors, and everybody does the same. So it's periodic boundary condition, so it's, it's, it's like this toroidal form. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, this is a uh, regular lattice, let's say. And on the right, we have a more, um, uh, more realistic representation of human uh, relations. We don't have, uh, all of us don't, don't have the same number of connections. We know that there are people with uh, thousands of friends in social network, for example, uh, and people that are, have a few friends. So this is the, the number of connections that we have. It's not the same for everybody, so it's not uh, uh, very regular. It's actually very heterogeneous. And one possibility uh, is to generate this sort of contact networks in which you have many individuals with a few con connections and just a few individuals with a lot of connections. This is the, the network uh, to the right. Well, the point is that the theory predicted that the network on the right should sustain more higher level of cooperation than the network on the left. So we did the experiment in 2011 using 42, uh, I mean, we, with 1,200 people uh, from, 20, from 42 schools in the Aragon area, that's in Spain, in community, in the community of Aragon, where Zaragoza is. This is a representation of, of the game, and these are the results. Uh, we found that uh, actually the network has no role in the level of cooperation. You see that uh, the level of cooperation for the lattice and the heterogeneous networks are roughly the same. Actually, if you look at the, how cooper cooperative uh, behavior behave in different realms, you see that they are more or less the same uh, kind of, of a structure. And this happens for, for the experiments itself and also for the control experiment, which is in which you, you just reshuffle the network every time step. And this is just to um, uh, prevent people 
to get acquainted with, with the neighbors. So in, in both cases, you see that this is the network has no effect, at least in the sense that this regular network produces the same results as the heterogeneous network. So this means that the structure of the population does, doesn't have an effect on the global level. And of course, this also means that human do not behave as theoretically assumed, and that we have to rethink the, the whole issue of why cooperation survive. And essentially this is because um, we, we, we don't behave in, in the way in which we we suppose it to be behaving uh, because uh, we don't take decisions based on the benefit. It, mean it, uh, it seems that we take decisions based on our environment. The more cooperators we have in our environment, the more uh, likely it is that we cooperate in the next round irrespective of whether they are more than us or not. We repeated this experiment to test for different other, uh, for other conditions, like for example, if this depends on the payoff matrix, uh, if there are cross-cultural effects, uh, if there is a dependency on the age of the individuals. And actually, we, we performed the, another experiment in 2012 uh, using uh, volunteers with age between 10 and 87 years old. Um, in this case, they were playing also a prisoner dilemma uh, for a number of rounds. And the result that we found was that uh, cooperation is uh, more or less the same, roughly the same, uh, except for children and the elderly. Um, and this was quite surprising because, um, well, on, on the one hand, this is okay because it allows us why window to, to of, I mean, to uh, choose individuals to do experiments from 18, 19 to uh, 60, 65. But on the other hand, it tells it, it tell us that uh, our attitude to, toward cooperative behavior change across lifetime, uh, at least in, in the very extreme cases. And this suggests also that we should put more attention uh, maybe in education when, when we are still at, at the childhood. Uh, and the reason, um, this is just to show that actually they, they behave uh, differently. Uh, this is the control and, and to the left, and, and you see that um, uh, there is the probability of cooperation depends on the number of cooperators in the neighborhood for all, all the, um, the age, except for the children, and that you can see on the right, and you see that for the children, uh, they don't take into account how many cooperators they have in the neighborhood. They, they play um, the probability of cooperation or actually of, of defecting also is roughly the same whatever the number of cooperators or the factors they have in their neighborhood. So this is something that uh, I didn't put the, the reference, but if you are interested in policy and nature communication this year or no, to last year. Um, So to answer also the question of um, how this could depend on the payoff matrix, on, on, on what is your respective benefit from, from cooperating or defecting, uh, we also performed another experiment. This was in 2014, also in Barcelona. Um, and also to explore um, all the other social dilemmas, not only the prisoner dilemma game. Uh, essentially, you have like four of them what is called the Stockham, the, uh, the snow drift, um, the armory gain, and the prisoner <coughs> dilemma. And, and, and also Simon was referring to, to this in the morning in the sense that the prisoner dilemma is not the only one, it's not the only social dilemma you can face. And you, sometimes you, you need to explore also um, situations in which you, you want people to coordinate, not to the fact of cooperate, but to coordinate to perform some tasks. And this is one of these gains. So we, we performed this, and essentially uh, this was a one-shot game, and, and every, in every round they were playing a game with, uh, in, in this coordinates, ST, that define how many, uh, what is the relation between what, what they, the cost they pay and, and the benefits they get. Um, in, the, in the top panel, in the central one, this is what is theoretically expected, why in the, in the rightmost panel in, in is it's what, what we got in the experiments. Uh, what we did was essentially then, after this, with all the experiments, we, we 
take the data, the, took the data, and run an unsupervising algorithm, essentially, uh, k-means, someone is a specialist in this, uh, just to try to classify individuals, because, of course, we, we don't want to have many different behaviors. If we are into model human behavior, we, we would like to have just a few class of behavior, because otherwise it's, it's impossible to take into account all um, possible human uh, behavior. So essentially when we did that, we, we found that there are, you, you can classify individuals for these social dilemmas in essentially five different phenotypes, if you want social phenotypes, we, we, that we call competitive, greedy, conservative, altruist, and, and finally cruelty. That essentially is, are people that uh, y y we don't know how, wh what is their strategy, so they essentially decide randomly. So this is another example of what you can do, and it's essentially showing you how people behave and these sort of things you have to take into account when modeling. Finally, I will go to the very, very large scales, and, and my aim here is to show that uh, human behavior at the very large scale Sometimes you can model them using uh, average values, but most of the time you cannot use uh, average values and, and, in, and details matter. Uh, and to, to show this, let's, let's take a classical example of a model that is quite known, it's the Granovetter's model. In the Granovetter's model you have n individuals, and each of these, in these individuals have a threshold that, um, that w when you get to a threshold or pass a threshold, you activate yourself. Suppose that you are talking about, I don't know, um, joining a mobilization. Then there is always the first adopter, this is the trigger, um, and then you have another individual with threshold one. This means that he needs one already active to join himself. There is another individual with threshold two, so on and so forth up to n minus one, which is the, the last individual. The last individual needs everybody else active to activate himself. So if this occurs, you, 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 this is like a domino effect, and at the end you have a cascade of size n. That means all individuals will be part of the collective action. So let's now assume that make a microscopic change in the, in the system, and, and let's suppose that instead of having the previous distribution, I have the first adapter, and I don't have anybody with threshold equal to one. Instead, I have two people with threshold equal to two. So once the first adapter activates, this generates cascade of size one. I mean, there, there is no collective behavior, actually. It's just the first adapter, because there is a big gap there in the threshold. So this is already showing, it's very simple, but it's already showing that details matter. In this case, the distribution of thresholds matter to uh, try to anticipate the, the, the size of, of the cascade. In this case, it could be, for example, the, the, the size of the mobilization or the social movement, etc. cetera. Um, we have done some work also in this direction, collecting data from, from large social systems, uh, in particular with Twitter, and we have analyzed, for example, the, the social movement in Spain, the 50M movement in Spain. Um, and here are the results. These are geolocalized movement. This was in 2011. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 2011. And, and this is already showing that the time scale of the diffusion dynamically is radically uh, reduced. And that the individuals are exposed to many sources of information they have to process. Uh, and uh, of course, individuals value these sources of information differently. And this adds some uh, degree of complexity to the problem. Actually, if we look in more details in the online world, um, the average in the approach, as we just showed with the Rabete model, doesn't, doesn't work neither. Uh, we have very, uh, very large sources of heterogeneities, and in particular, uh, we have the notion of who is influencer and, and who is not influencer. For example, this is just, just to show a case of a celebrity to the left is the number of messages he received, and to the right, the number of messages he sent. Uh, and you see that he actually is like a sink of information because he received many more information that he sends. And the other one is kind of typical user that is the contrary. He received less information that uh, the number of messages he sends out. So he's generating information. He's not a sink of information. 
and using these kind of things, you can actually classify individuals in different contexts and, and, and classify them. As in. So my last mention is and as a conclusion, um, I, I will want to phrase uh, Feynman, who once said that it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, it doesn't matter how smart you are, if it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. So my take home message is to, in this case, uh, as physicists, back to original physics, uh, observe the world, collect data, and do specifically design experiments in the hope that we understand how human behaves in different situations. Thank you very much.